Didier, thank you so much. Uh, very insightful words there. Um, staggering figures that you've just shared with us. And in fact, that, as you say, is, is part of the reason why we're all here today is to explore the opportunities where we can restart tourism uh, business across Africa, business tourism specifically so. And I think it's, it's also safe to say that tourism and trade are interrelated. And we need to find ways to start trading sooner rather than later. Because as you say, the bodies that have been left in the wake in terms of job losses, unemployment, poverty, it's, it's staggering and, and we need to figure a way to stop it and reverse that process. And I think uh, the, the humanitarian aspect here is more important than anything else. Um, very interesting that uh, you know you mentioned Africa. Indeed, uh, these a lot of positive things have been happening happening in and around Africa uh, pre-COVID, and it would be fantastic if we can get back on track. And I think this is a great opportunity for Africa to join hands, join forces, collaborate, and find ways to to make things happen. To that uh, extent, um, our first panel, if I might move on to that, um, we're talking to international suppliers um, of incentive groups and conferences, meetings, mice business, essentially, and also then talking to hotels. So it's, it's buyer and supplier across Africa, um, also to very different products, to very different businesses. And to that end, I would like to invite our first uh, uh, panel being Mr. Hugo Slimbrook from Ovation um, Global DMC. We have Mr. David Sand from You and Iwin. Then we have Mr. Rob Kachira from Radisson Blue Hotels, East Africa, and Ms. Rosemary Magimba from Serena Hotels. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm, I just don't have everybody on my screen at the moment. Let me see who's all there. Excellent. Um, great. So, excellent. Thank you. So, I'd like us to explore the the opportunities within Africa. So, Hugo, both yourself and David have businesses across the world and in Africa. Um, so, Hugo, let's start with you, if we may. Give us a quick overview of your business. What is your business relationship with Africa? Well, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for putting this all together. This is really a fantastic initiative uh, today. Uh, congratulations already thank for you. that. And thank you for, for asking our opinion as well. Um, yes, Ovation Global DMC, we are present in 10 countries in Africa. Uh, where we have strategic partnerships set up with local DMCs. That ranges from uh, Morocco, Egypt, Mauritius, South African countries, and uh, Rwanda and East Africa. So that's, uh, that's where we are operating through uh, partnerships in the, in the area. Uh, from on a global basis, of course, we have input from our own network um, of uh, clients that we uh, move around the world with meetings, events, conferences, and incentive travel. Uh, and so part of that is going to Africa. And that's probably the part that we will need to look at to change in the short future. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. So, David, if we, if we may move across to you, you are based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, Give us, give us your synopsis of your business and, and how the COVID situation has impacted on your business within Africa. Yeah. Hi, Tess, and um, hello to all the, the 86 people that are online watching. Uh, it's really a wonderful audience. So thank you um, for the opportunity. Tess, just a bit of a background. You and Iwin has, is an incentive agency. We do more than just travel as a reward set. We do other things too. Um, but we have uh, operational offices in Nairobi, in Lagos, and in Accra. Uh, we used to have one in Egypt, but uh, we closed that. Um, but from those hubs, and of course, Johannesburg is our, our main 
operating um, center in Africa. From those hubs, we are able to service our corporate clients across the Pan-African geography because we uh, use cloud-based technologies to uh, run incentive programs and uh, borders and geography are really not an issue for us. Um, so a lot of our clients that we've contracted in South Africa have us um, incentivize their distribution channel throughout Africa in various different ways. Um, we are really um, a, uh, an initiator of incentive travel rewards uh, and most of our reward programs are outbound or regional out of uh, regional into Africa or outbound out of Africa to the world. And, uh, you know, we would be a, a prime customer of Hugo's business who then receives um, our corporate clients, participants into a destination. Um, so that's just a bit of background. Just refresh me on what, what else you wanted me to answer. Well, how has COVID-19 influenced your business? Uh, let's first talk about the yeah. African aspect of that. Sure. So, um, like everything, all the travel contracts have been cancelled or suspended um, and pushed, pushed to a later date. Um, we've been in uh, a lot of close contact, of course, with our uh, corporate client um, planners and organisers. And their businesses are in as big a shambles as ours are. Um, and a, a lot of their focus is on their primary objective of getting their business back on track. Um, and so it's very difficult to get the incentive travel discussion as a priority on their list because it's kind of low down at the moment. But we have managed to have several of those conversations. And it's fairly positive uh, from a perspective of that a corporate decision maker has the belief that the power of an incentive and especially an incentive travel program is a tremendous motivator to business results. So I'm very encouraged by the conversations that I've had with um, the various um, customers that I've had that incentive travel is certainly going to be back on the cards and quite quickly. So that links into Didier's point is that it will be a bounce back factor. However, if you then start scratching and you ask deeper level questions, the big concern that all corporate decision makers have with regard to travel is will my people be safe? And secondly, if I contract with you today, how am I going to ensure that my money is safe and that deposits and things paid for forward advanced um, things, we don't lose money like we've lost in this situation through cancellations. So one of my big insurance clients on one of their programs lost a 9 million rand, which is, you know, uh, it's, it's a big chunk of change in any exchange uh, that you want to convert that to. So um, we, we obviously scrambled to try and get them a little bit of that money back and prove our worth as an agency. So the two factors, people safety and then money safety um, and lowering the risk on that. So I urge all of you on the supply side to start helping us as incentive agencies with those answers for our customers. Because if I can then go to a corporate decision maker and say, hey, you know what? We've, we've ticked the box around personal safety of your, your guests. Um, these are the things that we're putting in place. These are what our travel partners are putting in place to make sure that we've got the safety of your, your people as our prime uh, priority. Then in addition, if you contract with us, there are certain flexibilities and clauses built into this contract. If we are hit with a second wave or a third wave of pandemic, these are the financial terms in which we are able to ensure the safety of your money is not at risk. 
And I think that if we answer those two big questions, we will we'll overcome a lot of the major hurdles. Of course, there are going to be other dynamics as well to think about. But from my point of view as, a, as a, an agency, encouraging the use of incentive travel, those are the two big conversations that I'm going to have to have with my corporate clients. So I hope that gives you perspective. Thank you so much, David. Um, very important points you made there. And indeed, the people and money safety, uh, those are threads that we'll probably carry throughout the conversation for the rest of the day. Now, before we move on to the hotels, Hugo, may we redirect to you for a moment and just get your perspective on, on, on your clients. Um, obviously, from a European perspective, things are, are changing over there. Things are slowly but surely opening up. How will the, uh, your clients' decisions change if we can manage to open up the African skies and African borders? Well, first of all, our clients are not only from Europe. I mean, as a global company, the MCI Group, we have a major uh, influx of business out of Europe. That's for sure. That's the number one market. But US and Canada is important. And then we have two important hubs in Singapore and Shanghai that are providing business all over the globe. So it's, it's not just from a European perspective. The concerns that our clients have are exactly the ones that David has just uh, mentioned. It's about security. And if we need to do something before reaching out to our clients first is to make sure that we have the systems in place, the protocols in place to, um, to, to provide uh, that security, both financial and, uh, and healthcare uh, security. That's absolutely the, the most important thing to do. Um, until then, major corporations will not let their troops travel because of uh, insurance, the, first of all, they're, they're thinking about their own people, they're thinking about their channel partners, but also it's about their insurance companies that are not going to cover international travel either. So um, they do not want to, to run that risk as well. So we need to have those securities in place, first of all. Absolutely. And that, that's, uh, that goes without saying. So now may I go over to you, Rob. Um, with, with your hotel groups in Africa, if you would kindly just give the audience an overview of, um, you know, your, your operations within Africa. Um, and I know I was very privileged when I was in Kenya recently, I had a personal tour of the beautiful Upper Hill, uh, Bradis and Blue in Nairobi, where I believe it's one of the um, top rated security uh, hotels in the world. But how does one deal with an enemy one can't see. Um, and Rob, based on what uh, David and Hugo just shared with us, what is your take on, on the general situation? Over to you. Thank you, Tessa, and good morning, everybody. Um, on, uh, on East Africa's side and from the hotel point of view, if we look at the situation in East Africa, obviously we've got uh, six properties in, in Africa and four of them have been closed since April. So we've been only operating two in Nairobi and uh, very minimal business um, coming from there. So it's a survival uh, mode at the moment um, to the best abilities. And there, there are, if, if things don't change quickly, um, as the, as Hichu and, and, and David mentioned, there is going to be serious consequences coming down the line. And the bottom line is, if we have a look at it, is COVID is yet to stay for 12 to 18 months. Um, and we, we, we have to start working around that. We, we, we have to look at the safety protocols, whether it is from the hotel, the airlines, whether it is what David and you mentioned from a security point of view, an insurance point of view, contractually to, to secure we can build all that into in, into contracts, um, but from a hotel uh, point of view, to 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 give the the customer the comfort, what m the big groups are doing at the moment is they are signing with um, major specialist companies. For example, the the Radisson have just signed with S SGS, which is a specialized cleaning company. And each hotel has to go through a thorough, a thorough assessment uh, 
um, and then uh, be graded and then to be certified as well. And only once you are certified, then we can use the SGS um, logo on all our branding to give the customer that comfort of when he is traveling that um, the, the security protocols are in place. And, um, and, uh, and that is from the sanitization to the mask, to the screens, to the cardless menus, all of that. Um, we are currently, uh, although we are closed, we are busy implementing and um, putting that into place to be certified so that at least when we decide to open, which I would say from a Kenyan point of view, we're looking at earliest 15th of uh, July to 1st of August, we are ready to move forward and give that customer that comfort if he, if he books that we are ready to, to receive them. Thank you, Rob. Um, and it's, it's great to know, and I certainly think comforting to a lot of potential clients out there, is that the hotels are being proactive. The properties, the venues, um, restaurants, everybody's being proactive in making sure that the health safety protocols are up to standard. And it's, it's good to know that there, that there are um, bodies in place to actually monitor and, and um, you know, put a stamp of approval on it. So, um, Rosemary, if we may move across to you, um, you have some magnificent properties across Africa, um, and, and a nice mix of properties too, both from a corporate and a, um, a gaming uh, experience. Would you mind giving us a, a short overview for those who are not familiar with Serena Hotels, and, and then give us your take on, on the situation across the continent. Thank you. Thank you, Tess, and uh, hello, everybody. Great uh, to, for this opportunity uh, to talk. Uh, and um, yes, just to give um, an introduction of Serena Hotels um, Africa. We are a African hospitality brand. We have 24 properties. We're in Kenya, in uh, Tanzania and Zanzibar, in Uganda, Rwanda, Mozambique, and uh, soon opening up a property in uh, Goma in the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. Uh, within our portfolio of 24 properties, we have city hotels in all the uh, uh, capital cities in uh, East Africa, in the East African countries. And that includes two properties, that is the Nairobi Serena Hotel in Nairobi and the Kampala Serena Hotel in Kampala, Uganda, which are members of uh, the leading hotels of the World Consortium. We also have uh, safari lodges in uh, all uh, the key game reserves and national parks in Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, and we have small luxury camps also in Kenya and Tanzania. And then we have uh, resorts in Mombasa. In, um, we have a golf and um, spa resort in Uganda and a lake resort in uh, Rwanda. So yes, uh, that is um, Serena Hotels. Sorry, Tessa, did you, what was the second question you asked? Yeah, sorry, I just realized I'm on mute. Um, yes, considering what, what David and, and Hugo has just raised in terms of their clients, where, where their priority is, first of all, health, and secondly, financial safety. What has been the take from Serena's point of view? People who pay deposits, um, are you prepared to refund? Are you, um, you know, encouraging them to postpone? What is the general situation? Uh, firstly, to echo, um, what Rob said, um, it has been a very difficult uh, business landscape for us since March. Uh, we have had to close our properties, obviously, as uh, business declined to literally nothing, uh, which is where we are at the moment. Or, uh, although, as from now, we have begun um, opening uh, properties 
as we see the easing of um, uh, the various restrictions in the different countries where we are at, just as an example, uh, our golf uh, resort in uh, Uganda, the Victoria Serena Golf Resort is um, now open. Tanzania, um, we are looking to opening our properties uh, as from July. But um, uh, so that's, that's what we are doing. And as uh, Rob uh, pointed out, I would uh, repeat, we are busy uh, actually working very hard to implement the required um, uh, measures and protocols so that when we are back in operations, we'll be ready um, for our esteemed clients. But um, coming to the issue of um, payments and refunds, it has really been difficult. Um, as you know, at the end of the day, our business uh, is all about relations, maintaining relations. And despite the difficult situations that we have found ourselves in, one of the things we've had to keep remembering is there is a tomorrow. Things may be the way they are at the moment, but there is a tomorrow. And we do need each other. In fact, um, uh, if anything, we will need each other so much more with our business suppliers across board. And um, we've had to work out uh, as a company, we've had to come up with uh, some agreeable ways of how do we make sure that um, if a traveler who had booked, paid, but because of the unfortunate circumstances that uh, came up, is not able to travel or not willing to travel uh, in the now and wants to be paid back his um, uh, 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 you know, want a refund. Uh, we've had to actually um, come up with um, uh, an agreeable way. I'm not saying it is easy because it's a question of are we able to uh, pay within the required time some of the uh, refund immediately uh, for you? Reasons. Uh, and we, uh, because of uh, regular cash flow coming in, work out how will we manage this. So, what I can say is, I myself, particularly in my position, have noticed. We've moved the game of negotiating, talking. Yes, you might have to come back to Rosemary. She's having problems with her connection. Thank you, John. Um, Rosemary, we'll get back to you as soon as uh, your, your sound is back up and running again. Um, Hugo, may we redirect to you on this one. Um, as you mentioned, logically so, many corporates will not even consider traveling for the foreseeable future due to insurance issues and, you know, them wanting to make sure that their people are safe wherever they go. Do you find there's a shift in uh, going from incentive travel, um, stopping incentives and going to cash or, or gifting rewards, or are they just simply postponing until who knows when? Well, David mentioned uh, earlier as well that uh, in incentives have been earned already. So uh, a lot of people were expecting to travel uh, this time and uh, still uh, waiting for the trip to happen. And uh, I don't think that any company will, uh, will change that. Um, of course, for the moment, there's more uh, nudge towards uh, merchandising. Um, but in the end, it's, it's still the, the travel incentive, the experience incentive is still the most motivating uh, one of, uh, of all. And I'm sure that is going to, to, to remain strong even in the, uh, in the, in, in the long term. Um, our clients are not only incentive clients. Uh, we, we have association conferences, we have corporate meetings and events, and we have uh, uh, incentive uh, trips. A lot of them come through third-party agencies, so there's, there's several steps between the, the traveler, the origin originating uh, company, 
the agency in between and then ourselves and uh, our partner suppliers uh, on, on site. So it's a very complicated uh, uh, collection of people who are uh, who are involved. Um, I don't think that that incentive travel will will go away, but they will be looking for other destinations, and that that I think is an opportunity for Africa for the moment, because um, they will not travel as far. They will travel within the country or go to neighboring countries, and we have seen uh, business outbound business out of Africa coming into Europe and into North America and some into Asia as well in the past. Those groups will probably remain in Africa and that's that's the first opportunity I believe for uh, suppliers and partners to, to, to look out for is the, the, the business that uh, traditionally was long haul out of Africa, uh, North Africa and South Africa in particular um, that is now going to remain in the, in the, in the region. That's certainly one uh, that we need to look at. But secondly, yeah, uh, secondly, um, I believe that a lot of us are not familiar of working on a domestic uh, basis. A lot of the agencies like DMCs have been working with business from abroad and not necessarily with clients from their own country. So they will need to revisit the way that they're doing business uh, locally. They will need to look at products and services that are being offered, destinations that are being offered. Some destinations that haven't been offered to an international clientele now have an opportunity to uh, to work on a domestic or on a regional basis. And I think that's a, that's the first opportunity and some of the silver lining that we have in the, in the whole program here. That's, that's definitely something that we need to work on. Um, I heard earlier in the conversation here, we need to, uh, although our properties are closed and some of the office, offices are closed, I mean, we need to work on the future and we need to work on re-looking at terms and uh, uh, contract contract terms and deposit terms and so forth. We need to revisit that, so or most of us have done that in the meantime because there's certainly other crises coming after this. Um, but we need to look at at primarily developing new products, new services, new ways of of, of going about. What will be important is that, and it will be a big opportunity as well, is that. We, a lot of companies have pivoted from a live event to an online event. In the, in, and this is not going to go away. So we better make ourselves a specialist in this. And definitely DMCs need to rethink this. How can they deliver on a local basis um, on technology? New technology, new meeting technology, new... Uh, uh, team building <laughs> events uh, even. How do they do this? We have been looking, and I, and I, and I know a lot, of, a lot of our partners around the world are looking at changing the way that they're doing, that they're doing site inspection for the moment. Some site inspections cannot happen. They can happen virtually. And we have seen already several techniques being used by some of our partners of doing uh, online site, uh, site inspection. Um, this is definitely, these are definitely the opportunities that we need to look at. We, are, we need to do our homework now to be able to come out of the situation strongly once that our clients will be able to travel again. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Hugo. And I really think you've hit the nail on the head. And I, I do believe it's one of the reasons why we're having this conversation today is to encourage and promote intra-African uh, intra business. Um, us Africans have not been very good at doing business with each other. For some reason, we always want to fly off to Europe or America or Asia, but uh, we forget about what's beautiful and wonderful and practical within our own backyard. So this is a great opportunity for us to explore that. Um, and, and on that, Rob, may I uh, come back to you in terms of the local and regional market? What opportunities do you see for for Africa with, within our own backyard? I think if we, if we have a look at East Africa, obviously one of the, the major feeder market is South Africa, coming into East Africa. But I definitely foresee um, East Africa trading um, a lot more in between ourselves, 
uh, to, to start off uh, initially um, what we would call regional and then move out, out as the, the restrictions get lifted and the countries start opening up. I don't foresee much coming from Europe side and the Americas. Uh, we still see quite a lot of interest from Dubai coming through. So on the point of the cancellations and that um, we, we've had $2.8 million uh, of business at our one property that has just shifted into the first and second quarter of 21, which, which shows me that the people still want to travel. They, 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 they still want to have their meeting and events. They still want to have the incentives. Without a doubt, they just shifted it across. On the cancellation side, it's, it's up to each uh, group or individual property to, to really negotiate those terms and be a lot more flexible going forward because that's going to be the key. Um, to be flexible, agile, and uh, as the panel said earlier, the second or third wave might come in two, three weeks' time, a month's time, and you've signed the contract, and that's going to be built in. So I foresee that uh, the initial travel would start regional and then move out uh, more further on as the countries open up. And... Uh, there's a lot more comfort with, with the countries that they're traveling to uh, moving forward. And obviously, again, from a marketing point of view, uh, Kenya is doing phenomenal work. Um, they've been a allocated a budget of, of, of $5 million uh, to really market the destinations and moving forward. So, so hopefully, when uh, we eventually get back to, to the new normal, um, if we have a look at the numbers, they, they say that uh, 2020 is a write-off. Uh, 2021, we're looking at between 7 and 15% of 2019 figures. Um, that is quoted by STR and PwC moving forward. So only real good recovery would be coming in 22, 23 uh, moving forward. I, I know that um, at the moment... Uh, from a Kenyan point of view, we're looking at opening the domestic airports um, around about the 15th of July and then eventually international. I found out yesterday Tanzania opened up and their first flight arrived into Tanzania with tourists um, the day before yesterday. So they operational. So slowly but surely, um, as soon as we get traction, into the new normal, there will be a, a ramp up of the business going forward. Thank you, Robert. That, that's very encouraging. And I have to say, Kenya has been very progressive in general in their approach to you know, beating this thing called COVID and, and getting back to business as soon as possible. Can we just see if uh, Rosemary is, is perhaps back? Um, just Rosemary, if you can take your mute off. Because we unfortunately lost you there towards the end. It looks like yes. she's back. Rosemary, yes, sorry. We lost yes, the, the, the last minute of, of your um, previous chat. Would you like to, to um, conclude that and then give us your take on regional and intra-African business? Yes, sorry, I lost uh, a bit. Uh, but what I was um, saying is um, <clears throat> one of the... Uh, learns that we have gotten as a result of um, <clears throat> this uh, situation is um, <clears throat> the importance of um, relations because we are having to learn how to talk with our business suppliers in difficult um, situations whereby uh, if you're not being paid, you're not able to pay, you want your money, you know, um, it's uh, put us in a new landscape of uh, uh, very intense relational um, um, uh, situations, which I value because I think it will be part of um, uh, what will carry us into the future, even as we review uh, various um, policies and procedures, because obviously <clears throat> many things to do with the uh, payments cannot continue the way they were uh, from, from my um, perspective. Um, coming to um, 
the issue of uh, business in Africa. I look at this as a really exciting opportunity for Africa. If I can just give um, an example for Serena Hotels, when September 11 happened uh, way back, um, it was a fantastic wake up call for, uh, for us and for the industry at large in Kenya uh, about market diversification. And <clears throat> Serena started on a journey of um, uh, getting the local business. And I can say over the years, we have come from a place where the domestic market used to be just about 5% of our total business. Today, we can talk of about 30%. So the way I look at this is um, we have been given a golden opportunity to actually, uh, not because we don't have a choice, but because um, Africa is what it is. We're in Africa. We're about Africa. So in taking advantage of what we have uh, that has been thrown at us at the moment, we have a great opportunity to sell ourselves as what we are uh, to uh, the domestic market. And then even more in terms of the regional uh, markets. As Serena, because of where we are in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, <clears throat> Tanzania, we're going into Goma, we are forced to have to um, look to regional synergies, uh, both for corporate and um, uh, leisure business. So um, when I look at some of the challenges that uh, in the past have affected our, our being able to grow uh, the regional business and now Africa as a whole, I'm seeing that, um, and I've seen there has been lots of conversations to say that um, some of the impediments that have affected the growth of uh, the African business uh, and the regional business, you know, things like um, uh, the cost of travel within Africa because of, um, uh, you know, airlines um, not being able to really uh, uh, give uh, <clears throat> uh, better um, fares, uh, things like visas for inter-Africa uh, travel uh, and other such impediments. I think because of the situation and the fact that there are conversations ongoing, if we have these lifted, or at least looked at, and I believe we don't have a choice, there will be, it'll even enable us in the now, as we look to survival business, as we look to recover, um, that will greatly help us be able to build our numbers because we have to rely on what we have at hand at, at the moment. The other thing that um, uh, I do believe um, uh, presents a great opportunity is collaborations uh, uh, that again, you just have to, you know, you have to look for partnerships, for uh, opportunities to uh, work together because together you're stronger. And uh, I think it is also um, a great opportunity. You know, I like to say that um, we as Africans are the ones who tell our story best. And sometimes Africa, our continent, um, and I all, and I believe you all bear witness to this, is uh, what comes of, out of Africa out there tends to unfortunately be uh, negative. It's all about wars, about politics, about um, uh, uh, diseases, and so on and so forth. Now, again, if we're talking about survival, especially in this initial stage between now and the end of the year, when we don't see much in terms of uh, recovery uh, for the international market, again, part of the uh, conversation that needs to be had, part of the agenda that we need to look at, beginning with ourselves, is how to make sure that we take a positive story about 
we ourselves, about Africa, about our experiences out there, so that uh, we can take our place uh, out there for what we really are. And we all know, you know, that at the end of the day, because this is what we sell, Africa is great, has some fantastic experiences and products and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So I do believe that the golden opportunity that we have as we work together individually to push ourselves and as partners, I think we can actually be able to turn um, the recovery uh, uh, situation probably mm -hmm. to be able to do it a little faster than we, uh, we might be able to expect. That is Wonderful. my take and that's how I'd like to approach things. Yeah. Thank you. Rosemary, that is great. I, I do think that is generally the direction that we hope to be heading in is, is to, to make things turn around faster than what current predictions are. And I absolutely love and agree with your comment on our African stories are best told ourselves. And I agree. Let's move away from the negatives. There's, there's hopelessly too much negative about Africa out there. And we need to change that messaging into the positive because we have so much of it. Um, I, we're almost out of time for the session. We do have a question uh, from Hassan Ding from Turkey, which uh, we'd like to uh, um, aim at David. Um, I'll just read the question for the audience in case you don't see it. He states, from incoming perspective, Germany announced yesterday to only allow travel within the EU until the 31st of August. What kind of an impact do you foresee in this regard? David? Yeah, hello, Hassan, and thanks for asking an interesting question. Um, I think, you know, these uh, regional travel bubbles um, are, are going to play a major part in the problem or the future solutions. Um, if Europeans are only going to be allowed to travel within Europe, then that excludes travel to Africa. Uh, so that, you know, that just uh, creates a lot less demand for Africa product. If Africans are not allowed to travel to Europe or elsewhere, and we have to travel within our own bubble, well, that creates opportunity for um, African destinations. But I just want to talk about something a little bit maybe controversial that will stand on somebody's maybe if some of your toes so here goes <laughs> um, if i take the south african incentive traveler they have been all over the world to the most sophisticated destinations hotels and experiences on the planet africa has to up its game when it comes to experiences, especially regional Africa experiences. My understanding of most of our thinking in Africa is that we're going to bring in these Europeans or Asians or South Americans or Americans into Africa and give them this really sort of rustic Africa in the bush, wild animals, gorillas, and that's cool. Now that is cool, and it's completely wow. But it, from a South African point of view, traveling into Africa, that's not good enough. Because we have all the game and all of those products, um, and, and we understand it. And so even if a South African travels to a South African product as an incentive experience, so let's say a practical example, uh, I sell to one of my customers, let's go to Sabi Sabi, one of the best luxury game experiences in the planet, no question about it. The question is, is that inspirational enough for an African uh, experience from one African to an African experience and I would say it's not good enough because we are 
Africa is our home experience. It's our comfort zone. When we want to use inspirational travel as Africans, we want to travel to LA and London and cool places around the planet that are not our home experience. We want to get a different experience and that's what motivates us. So we have to reimagine the Africa experience for African travelers. So I know, for example, our clients in Nigeria love coming to South Africa, but it's not for the bush. They love coming to Santon City to shop and to party and nightclub and be cool. It's almost like the LA or New York experience. That's what they want when they're coming to South Africa. They don't want beaches. They don't want, definitely don't want game farms. Um, so we have to reimagine our destination experience for Africans. Because if we're going to be limited to a, a, a regional or Africa bubble, for, for starters, we have got to rethink that and reimagine it. So, you know, for me, I would love to sell Lagos as a product, as an experience. Everybody says Lagos, oh no, not Lagos. But Lagos is a super cool city. It's got radical things that you won't find anywhere in the world. You've got experiences that are, if packaged right, are amazing. But we are not packaging those anywhere near where we should be for, from a, a destination point of view. And destinations have been so focused in Africa on the Congress experience, the leisure experience, the safari experience, and haven't given any thought to the incentive travel experience in a serious way. Tourism boards have not done it. And I suggest if you're a tourism board type of person, you've got to start thinking about that because um, the big European meetings are not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, that's serious food for thought. I'm, I'm not entirely going to disagree with you, but I, outside this meeting, I'll, I'll mention some other opportunities to you within Africa that have certainly not been explored and certainly... Uh, offers a wow factor that you don't get anywhere else in the world. But that probably will take a separate webinar to explore that one. But good point. Tourism boards, marketing people, Dave has a very solid point there, so let's think about that. Unfortunately, we're out of time, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to our esteemed panel, Hugo, Rob, David, and Rosemary. Thank you so much for giving up your valuable time and your insights. Um, we have a lot more to explore, and I think we should just move straight on to our next panel.